My name is Nicole Litvak, and I'm a solar analyst with GTM Research. The topic of this panel is PV asset management and operations and maintenance. We've actually never had this exact topic as a panel before. We've talked about operations and maintenance, but not necessarily asset management. Um, but I think it's an extremely important topic to discuss in such a young and quickly growing industry. As MJ mentioned earlier, as of the end of last year, there were already over 130 gigawatts of operating solar capacity online globally, and that's expected to double in just about the next three years. So what I want to talk about today is not just the challenges, uh, system issues, and costs that we're facing today, but how those will change over the next 10, 20 years and how we're preparing for that now. So I'm happy to have um, a wonderful uh, set of panelists here who can talk about uh, a range of um, business models and, and market segments within the solar industry. So we're going to start, um, by, I'm going to have each of you introduce yourselves, and just so we're all on the same page here, I'm going to ask you to define asset management, particularly as it relates to your company and maybe even your role within the company. We'll start sure. with you. Uh, Joe Brotherton, I'm president at MaxGen Energy Services. We are an independent uh, O&M provider. Uh, so for us, uh, the term asset management means more of, of managing the physical facility or, or power plant and the things that are involved in operating that power plant. So whether it's you know, maintaining landscaping of the leased area or you know, the actual technical components within the, the project boundaries, that's, that's how we would define asset management. Okay. Good afternoon, I'm Mark McClanahan, the President of Global Services at Sun Edison. For us, asset management actually, uh, there's two parts. We have the O&M, which is the actual plant operations, and then we have the operations of the SPV itself. So typically the plants are owned by um, a project company. That project company is a small business or a large business, depending on the size of the plant. And um, you need to manage vendors, accounting, um, cash flows, uh, contractual requirements, covenants, et cetera. So there's two pieces together for us or asset management. Good afternoon. Chad Sachs, the CEO of Reagan Generation. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Nicole and GTM in general for setting up this panel. This is definitely uh, not a topic that's commonly talked about, and we do appreciate that. When we think of asset management, similar to Mark, <clears throat> we really focus on um, basically the SPV management, as Mark called it. We really look at asset management in three columns. First of all, the asset operations, which is overseeing the O&M providers, really looking at production monitoring and helping the owner understand how that asset is performing, um, but using other service providers to fulfill on that. Secondly is the contract administration and compliance, and that involves you know, critical contracts, PPAs, site leases, making sure there's no footfalls, but also a lot of the regulatory compliance for state incentives at the commercial DG level or in the utility space, um, you know, forecasting or certain aspects of the PPA to make sure they're doing. And then lastly is the more traditional financial asset management, which is keeping investors and lenders informed and aware of all the requirements and covenants that they would require. And my name is David Kenny. I'm the director of fleet operations at Sunrun. And uh, similar to the rest of the panelists, we think of asset management as a uh, broad conceptual framework for everything that goes into running our assets on behalf of the funds that own them. So that includes the operations and maintenance, metering, monitoring, uh, what we call performance engineering, which is our alerting engine and the field service response. And then uh, in addition to what we heard uh, just now, Sunrun uh, is a uh, exclusive participant in the residential space. So uh, we're also uh, involved in uh, consumer billing and collections. And then also uh, we have a customer care department that fields inbound calls from customers. So there's a little bit of a unique twist on it from, uh, from the residential perspective. Great, well thank you all for joining me today. So as I mentioned, um, and as you all know, this is an extremely young industry. Most of the PV systems online today were only installed in, in the last three or four years. 
So how exactly do you estimate the long-term costs of operating and maintaining a system given such limited historical performance data? Um, Mark, I'll start with you. Uh, very difficult uh, to do that. So I, I was a project developer early, early on, and um, we, you know, O&M and asset management was a field in a spreadsheet that we used to populate, and that was about it. And so I'm seeing a lot of uh, head nods. So I think that we were probably all guilty of just estimating a number and then pushing it down the field and hoping the project gets across the finish line. So uh, on the O&M side, we definitely have a lot of very good data now. So if we're talking about O&M specifically, I think we have a very good understanding of what the costs are and we can model those with a good degree of accuracy. Some of the pieces that we can't do, model so accurately would be the long-term um, equipment repair costs. And the, you know, whether it's an inverter, combiner box, uh, tracker, et cetera, those are still some things that are, I think I would consider to be equity risk. Mm -hmm. The O&M side, or the, sorry, the asset management side is a, uh, also a field in a spreadsheet, but uh, we don't have as much knowledge about that yet. Um, we, I think there's probably six or seven comps in the market globally for us, you know, pure asset management services. And um, building up from the ground up what the actual cost is and, and what we can expect long term is, is a much more difficult exercise. We, you know, frankly, we have some baselines, we have some pricing for it, but it really depends on uh, how high maintenance the project is. So what are some assumptions that you have to make about, um, I guess, particularly with regards to performance of components? Well, I think uh, you, you want to look at how complex the deal is. How many counterparties are there? How many suppliers? How many contracts? Uh, what kinds of covenants? Are you operating in CalISO or is it a DG project, right? Or do you have um, a long-term loan or is it equity only? Those are some of the variables that will drive workload. And then what are the requirements um, under the O&M contract if you're managing an O&M contractor? You know, how uh, heavy-handed do you need to be in enforcing those? What kinds of requirements are there for, uh, for performance? Also, uh, the warranties. The warranties are a big one. Uh, enforcing the warranties, following up on warranty claims, those sorts of things can also be a, work, uh, a big work driver. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, Chad, I want to ask you, do you think that overall the industry is underestimating these costs? I, um, yes, but the, <laughs> I guess the question is, who cares, right? And I think one of the big problems in the industry, at least in the United States, is the owners are the ones who are buying these assets and they're underwriting what they think is appropriate. I don't think owners are crazy. I think that the investment tax credit has encouraged certain behavior that means that it is more advantageous to underwrite uh, very low costs. So some examples are you would rather pay a higher EPC cost because that enhances some of the economic benefits, particularly the tax benefits, and in turn get the hope of a warranty and take a very low um, O&M uh, estimate. And so I do think particularly deals have been structured where they depress those prices a lot. And so then you ask, you know, have they made those projections too low? So then once again, when you look at the owners of these assets, the tax equity, the debt providers who provide most of the capital, they have structured the investments so if bad things start to happen, if the cash flows are less, if the production is less, their investment's still protected. I think as the industry is maturing, you're starting to see more cash-based investors coming in. Clearly, when you have securitizations happening, when you have pension funds starting to come in, when you have more traditional private equity funds that are really focused on that cash flow base, there's going to be a whole different perspective into that. And so I do think that's where Mark's quote, you know, there's things that you can predict, preventive maintenance, you know, ideally some asset management fees, and then there's the corrective maintenance, things that are unexpected. And it's particularly on the unexpected parts that the industry is learning, is maturing, and I think that's where the industry has probably been aggressive in its assumptions. You brought up a lot of great points in it, um, there that I'm gonna come back to, but first I wanna ask David, uh, on the residential side, so it's a little bit different, you don't have you know, some of the same ongoing maintenance costs, do you think that that is causing people to underestimate um, residential O&M costs even more? <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'm glad I'm the third one to answer this question because uh, I was worried I'd have to go first. Um, it's, it's equally challenging in the residential space and there are a lot of assumptions that go into forecasting 
project lifecycle service budget. Um, there are a few unique considerations, though, in the residential space that we, uh, we look into. Um, one example is the uh, network efficiency of concentrating projects within a geographic region. Um, so as our uh, asset base builds up and we go from hundreds to thousands of systems within a single zip code in San Jose, we can start to look at decreasing labor costs to service assets because you're doing multiple service calls per day. Um, so that's certainly a factor that we take into consideration. Um, we also have the benefit of looking at servicing costs across portfolios of thousands within a fund and uh, across our whole install base, tens of thousands of assets. So we look at uh, service as a function of unit cost. So what's the incident rate of a specific activity? And then what's the unit cost of that, that activity, both in terms of labor and equipment? And uh, when you have a, a fleet size that's large enough, you can start to uh, extrapolate out um, with some of those generalizations and get a pretty good sense of what's going on. But even with such a large fleet size, I mean, you still have the same issue as large scale systems where the systems just haven't been around for very long. So, you know, how do you take that into account? Yeah, um, maybe a, a good example of, uh, so it's, it's also a function of what the, the corporate policy is in response to different service issues. Um, an example of that is uh, big in our world, um, and it usually gets uh, a chuckle out of a crowd, but one of the uh, biggest single line items in our service budget relates to wildlife guards and pigeon poop and cleaning up pigeon poop and whatnot. Um, there are some subjective decisions that go into how you respond to an event like that that's called in from a homeowner. Um, so some of, some of the surprises that you see uh, five years ago, we, we didn't have a line item in our service budget for pigeon poop, um, but we're in a position to uh, make, uh, make decisions around how we respond to that that allow us to control that budget over time as well. So there's actually a, a cost per watt of pigeon poop removal over time. It's a sub, it's a sub line item. Okay. <laughs> um, so a few of you mentioned, you know, some of these bad things that could happen, and I want to get more into some of those. Um, you mentioned, Mark, the, the warranties that come with a lot of the equipment. Um, but my question is, what happens if, um, you know, in the case of an insolvency of one of these suppliers? Joe, have you, you know, had any experience with that? Or? We have. Um, obviously, I I think everyone understands the inverter issue, and we have a, a number of that particular manufacturer's inverters that, that we're managing now and, and need to respond to issues or find parts for. And it, it's a challenge, and it's something that no one really could have predicted you know, that would happen or what the cost, cost would be. So you know, that was, that's a pretty large component to all of a sudden have go, or a component manufacturer to all of a sudden have go away, and, and it's, it's been, a, a, a budget crisis for a lot of our owners, and you know that's one one area where in others we have EPCs or installers that all of a sudden go away, and that five-year warranty they had really just disappears. So all of a sudden we're into a corrective maintenance budget that needs to be created, where someone thought they had a, a three or five-year window of everything was covered under this warranty, and in an O&M contract to a third-party O&M provider. Our contract is pretty clear that we do X, Y, Z for this much money and anything outside of that, we're gonna charge a time of material type of cost. So for the corrective things, because we can't predict the issues we have. So, I mean, the, the, in the case of insolvency, it's really, you know, either, you know, developers are making more intelligent decisions up front on, you know, we're right now, Maxion is mainly dealing with large scale facilities. I, I don't think we'll have any of that on the stuff we deal with. But um, you know they're making more intelligent decisions, or their their line item gets bigger up front. And and I 100% agree with what Chad said earlier about how these how these deals are getting done. I, I think the the underestimation of, of an O and M cost is real, mainly because they're trying to get the projects done. So Mark, I want to ask you because um, Sun Edison is of course a developer. Do you take into account? Um, you know, insolvency and those other unexpected issues up front? Well, you can never predict it in advance. So right. um, we, we try and be very rigorous in the vendors that we, that we work with. So um, that's not a 100% guarantee, but that, that's a start. 
And you know, from my experience, you don't ever want to have to cash in on a warranty. You just don't want to. I mean, as good as a warranty is, you just don't want to have to use it because it's hard to get people to part with money. It, for some reason, people just don't like to part with their money. So, <laughs> so um, we try and pick the best equipment we can and then design and engineer it and install it in the best way possible to minimize the, the possibility of corrective uh, maintenance down the road. And, and that's, that's the best preventative maintenance uh, that you can do right there is install the system correctly and pick the right pick the right piece of equipment for, for the job, whatever the, you know, whatever the job is. So is the strategy to find, you know, just a few equipment suppliers who you trust um, that, you know, that both the system is going to, or the, the component is going to last, or that the company is not gonna go bankrupt, or do you kind of wanna... Um, Spread your risk. Yeah, exactly. And, is that of me? Yeah. <laughs> do you want me to answer that? Uh, there's trade-offs there, but generally speaking, I think it makes sense to try and pick folks that you you can do long-term business with and drive volume, uh, work through issues, because you're always going to have issues no matter what. And so if you have a trusted partner, I think it's easier to work through issues than if you have a new vendor. And so, yeah, I think the preference would be to pick a fewer number of strategic partners and drive volume rather than you know, hedging your bets with a lot of different suppliers. Would you agree with that, David? Because I know a lot of the leading residential companies only procure you know, modules or inverters from a very limited number of suppliers. Yeah, Sunrun also maintains an approved vendor list and uh, some of Paul's introductory remarks around the importance of uh, qualifying components and then making sure those components are installed in a quality way. Uh, to reduce the lifetime incident rate uh, really resonated.